Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the Abraham Accords. The first anniversary of the Abraham Accords was recently noted. For many, it was a celebratory occasion. Certainly, the decision by the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, and by Bahrain, the first two Arab countries to forge the United States brokered agreement with the Jewish state was monumental. And after they broke the proverbial ice, Morocco, Sudan, and Oman, too, chose membership in this new club. But what kind of club is it? The term peace treaty has been bandied about in conversations and in speeches and in the media of the Accords. But the Abraham Accords, as important and as vital and historic an agreement as it is or as they are, is not a peace treaty. That needs to be clear. Think business deal instead. More than anything else, the Abraham Accords is a business deal, a business deal between countries that never before entered into business deals, at least not openly, and in full public view. For the Arab partners, this business deal, brokered by and for business people, who also happen to be senior representatives of their respective countries, the business is crucially important to the country. And business between Israel and the Arab countries in the region, like the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, Oman, and others waiting in the wings for the right time to forge a relationship with Israel, has tremendous potential. These are markets and investors that Israel should tap and exploit. These deals will open markets for Israel, and Israel will be a boon for them. These countries are smart enough to realize that and secure enough in their standing in the Arab world and they are eager to invest in Israeli technology and startups and other emerging Israeli ventures. Aside from business and growth within Israel, travel-loving Israelis have gained new and exciting and formerly verboten vacation destinations. As much as Israel is exploiting these new opportunities, so have these Arab business people and leaders. They are taking as much advantage of the new opportunities as they can. But do not be deceived. These deals have not transformed the Middle East. Mainstream attitude in these countries towards the West, especially the United States and Israel, has not changed. The long-held and ingrained attitudes towards Israel, attitudes of the residents of these countries that have signed onto the Accords, have not changed, not one whit, not one iota. Israelis have a soft spot for countries that recognize and accept them. For the longest time, so few countries did. While this is a welcome change, Israel must not fall into the same self-deception hole that the United States inevitably and always falls into. Doing so is a costly mistake. Few values are shared between Israel and these nations. The most glaring are the values called freedom and equality. And while one might argue that Islam and Judaism are more similar than Christianity and Judaism, that is correct in theory, but not in practice. In the West, Christianity and Judaism, and now Islam, live side by side. Not so in Muslim lands. U.S. thinkers and decision makers do not understand this distinction. I hope that Israel ultimately realizes this point. There was never a religious reformation in Islam. And the Islam of the West is not the Islam of Islamic societies. In the West, Islam mimics Judaism and Christianity. Leaders and adherents blend Islamic tradition and values. And in the modern society, with post-reform values like equality, not understanding that results in cataclysmic mistakes and failures, like the United States' abysmal decision-making in Afghanistan. The leaders with whom Israel signed accords, the investors and business partners with whom they are entering into deals, do not represent the masses. They are people who are not dumbstruck and offended when they encounter women in the modern dress, women in boardrooms, women in positions of power. Unlike in Israel, there will be very little trickle-down and benefits of the accords to the masses in these Arab countries. This is not hypothetical thinking. It's facts on the ground. While Foreign Minister Yair Lapid was on an official visit to Manama, Bahrain, there were mass protests on the streets. 240 Muslim clerics signed a statement rejecting normalization with Israel. They went so far as to call Israel, their new partner, the Zionist enemy. They never call it Israel. Shiites and Sunnis, tribal enemies, united only in their hatred for Israel, protested the opening of the Israeli embassy there. The masses and their leaders most definitely do not see eye to eye. Celebrate, if you will, but do not celebrate a new dawn, new awakening. 
Do not celebrate peace treaties. These are accords. They are business deals. The Arab world has never confused the two. Neither should Israel. I've also been thinking about good and about evil. And there is evil in the world. The Holocaust was evil. And so is denying the Holocaust, just plain evil. The Nazi campaign to murder the Jews of Europe and then from there to eventually murder all the Jews of the world is a true historical event. It's a fact. Auschwitz-Birkenau was a factory of death. So were Treblinka, Sobibor, Chelmno, Belzitz, and Majdanek. Those are the death camps. The prime objective of these camps was to murder Jews. That's it, nothing more. They were not concentration camps or work camps. They were death camps. Those who deny the Holocaust are historically wrong. More than that, they are morally wrong. NBC News ran a piece, which was, has been picked up by other media, about a Texas school district instructing teachers to teach the opposing view if they teach about the Holocaust. Teachers were instructed to offer opposing views if they discuss books about the Holocaust, even children's books. Their libraries were told to stock these books. Gina Petty, the Carroll School District Director of Curriculum and Development, is quoted in the NBC uh, piece. The quote comes from an audio tape which was recorded by one of the teachers present in the session. And she said, just try to remember the concepts of the bill, 3979, she said. In mentioning 3979, Petty was referring to the new Texas law that requires teachers to present multiple perspectives while discussing, quote, widely debated and currently controversial issues, unquote. And then she continued, punctuating her point. Make sure that if, if, if you have a book on the Holocaust, that you have one that has opposing, that has other How do you oppose the Holocaust? To call this simply absurd is to minimize the significance and to debase the atrocities perpetrated by the Nazi regime during the Holocaust. The teachers asked questions. They wanted the school district director of curriculum and development to clarify her remarks. One teacher asked, how do you oppose the Holocaust? Well, I can answer that. Opposing views of the Holocaust, those views are held by deniers, a group composed of kooks, wackos, and anti-Semites. Holocaust deniers fall into two major groups, those who want to sterilize the Germans and those who use denial as a vehicle to deny Israel's right to exist. According to their argument, if Israel was created because of the Holocaust, then it follows that there was no Holocaust then Israel has no right to exist. For the Texas school district, this is a tempest in a teapot. I read the Texas House Bill 3979. Gina Petty misread it. Section two, which is the section that she was referring to, actually is very clear. The entire section of the bill reads, I'm reading in its entirety, teachers who choose to discuss current events or widely debated and currently controversial issues of public policy or social affairs shall to the best of their ability, strive to explore such issues from diverse and contending perspectives without giving deference to any one perspective. The Holocaust is not a controversial historical issue. The author of the bill made it very clear, politely so, that this instruction was absurd. In an interview, State Senator Brian Hughes, who wrote Senate Bill 3, this whole thing, emphasized that the bill was not about good and evil. It was not about purging books and, that teach about the Holocaust. According to Senator Hughes, and here's the quote, that's not what the bill says. I'm glad we have this discussion to help elucidate what the bill says, because that's not what the bill says. Unquote. Now, don't get me wrong. People have the right to be wrong, and people have the right to hold ideas and beliefs that are wrong. But they cannot and should not teach inaccurate and immoral things in public schools. The Holocaust is not a debated or debatable subject. Nazis Entscheidung trägt, getragen hat, denn who have stood trial admitted to their crimes. Eichmann in, on trial, let's say, for instance, in Jerusalem, the trial was so long and so drawn out for exactly that reason. The prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, wanted to record in the official legal documents the history of the Nazi murder of the Jews of Europe. The end result of this intention was a transcript of 107 sessions held over 13 months between April 61 and May 1962, bound in the five gargantuan volumes. The Eichmann trial in Jerusalem was a public trial. The accused was known as the man in the glass booth. Adolf Eichmann was kept behind bulletproof glass for fear of attempted assassination. Eichmann was responsible for transporting Jews to their deaths. He took pride in his work and in his efficiency. Hannah Arendt, 
watched the trial and reported on the proceedings for the New Yorker. She wrote five long and deeply insightful articles. Within that year, those articles were released as the classic work, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. The world becomes a different place because of the Holocaust. Before the Holocaust, no one could have imagined the depths of depravity and the murder to which one group could sink. No one could have imagined the enormity of the numbers, the numbers of people that were sought out and systematically murdered. No one would ever have imagined that machinery would be built to murder innocent people more efficiently. Learning about the Holocaust is learning about evil. It should hopefully make us better people. Denying the Holocaust will undoubtedly transform the world from a better place into an evil and worse place. In a way, we owe a debt of gratitude to its school district director who inadvertently and out of ignorance misunderstood a law that should have been so obvious and for allowing us to revisit the concept of good versus evil. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from the LA Times written by Rob Eshman. It was published September 5th, 2021, and it's an op-ed, Rosh Hashanah, Give Earth a Sabbatical. The column is about Shemitah, the biblical sabbatical year, and it ran in the LA Times. How did that happen? It deals with environmentalism. Shemitah is about the environment. This is how Eshman begins. When 70 climate activists stood outside Senator Dianne Feinstein's West Los Angeles field offices 10 days ago and blew the chauffeur, it wasn't their way of wishing the senator an early happy Jewish New Year. One clue, one of the protest signs read, so far, not so good. From the very start of his column, Eshman explains the link between the environment and the biblical concept of Shemitah. He continues, the activists were organized by a climate action group called Dayenu, loosely speaking, Hebrew for enough. Part of a campaign that is blowing the ritual ram's horn across the country to urge Congress to pass President Biden's $3.5 trillion Build Back Better budget bill focused in part on reducing carbon emissions. The connection between climate change and Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which begins the evening of September 6th, might not be immediately apparent, unless, that is, you're familiar with a fairly arcane Jewish custom of Shemitah. Shemitah rhymes with Pita, is a sabbatical year on the Jewish calendar, occurring every seven years, including in 5782, which begins Monday evening. Now Eshman provides the biblical background of Shemitah. He writes, during Shemitah, Jews are commanded to let the land of Israel lie fallow. The laws only apply to the land of Israel. They may not sow, harvest, or even buy and sell crops they produce from the land. They can only pick what grows on its own. Shemitah is set in the Bible. The seventh year shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath unto the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Eshman also explains that Shemitah is becoming more and more popular among non-Orthodox Jews, he continues. But Shemitah is increasingly marked by progressive Jews too, a connection that isn't hard to understand. This year, Shemitah follows the latest UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which warns that the spread of global warming will lead to catastrophe if we don't act now to stop and perhaps reverse it. This is how Eshman concludes. And yet, the lesson of Shemitah makes it clear that when it comes to caring for the earth, we must act together. Only common action can prevent a tragedy of the commons. That's why many non-Orthodox Jews and non-Jews have begun to bring attention to Shemitah as a lever to awaken faith-based activism against climate change. Shemitah is a biblical proof text that there's a time to sow and a time to reap and a time decreed from on high for society to let nature recover. And in the wake of a UN report that could easily resign us to despair, Shemitah and every Jewish New Year brings another message. It's not too late. Every year you can begin again to change your life or even save the planet. It's an excellent piece. Next up is a piece from the New York Post written by Ben Blanchett. The piece appeared on October 16th, 2021. It's headlined, TikTok's Old Jewish Men Demand Cheap Locks, Places to Pee in New York City Protests. Subtitled, Whether It's the Price of Locks or a Place to Pee, one of the latest TikTok trends features old dudes fetching for a cause. The piece, if you didn't already guess, 
from its titles is a spoof. It's about old Jewish men who want to make some serious changes. And to do that, they're raising their issues through humor on the popular video sharing app TikTok and other social media platforms, including Instagram. Blanchett begins, whether it's the price of locks or a place to pee, one of the latest TikTok trends features old dudes fetching for a cause. Make locks $2.99 per pound again, gripe the elderly social media stars at old Jewish men who take videos of the protests they stage around the city. The lifestyle brand from director Noah Rinsky, who has worked for international production company Vazlevez, features a clothing shop, memes, and snapshots of old Jewish men, some of whom are comedians or actors. The brand has over 46,000 Instagram followers and 38,000 TikTok followers. They air their grievances about the price of pastrami, wielding cardboard signs saying the top 1% owns 99% of the pastrami, or the lack of public toilets in New York City. In one video, they chant 2468, we just want to urinate. It's funny. People are getting behind the protests en masse, too. Enough for the brand to start a petition with about 3,700 signatures for more public toilets on its website. The members of this Actors Kvetchers group come from all areas of the Jewish life. Blanchett explains that they're all simply fed up. He writes, My religion is comedy and making people happy, Howard says. That's probably why I don't have any money, but it's too late now to change religions. Aaron Cohen, 69, of Brooklyn said, The brand is very relevant as an Orthodox Jew. People see me in the street and say, Hey, you're the toilet man. So I know we're having, some, <laughs> having an impact, he said. This piece, like this new and innovative group of old men, is very funny and very insightful. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you only one item today. It's a cartoon from YouTube that was posted October 9th, 2021. It was posted on an official Saudi media YouTube site in the cartoon format. It depicts a famous story from the Quran about how Jews were turned into apes. The entire episode is absurd. It also is very telling on two levels. First, it shows us how what Saudi children are being taught about Jews. Second, it shows us how Islam views Jews. كان هناك قرية من قرى اليهود تشرف على البحر وكان من شرع الله لهم أن حرم عليهم الصيد يوم السبت وأمرهم بالتفرغ للعبادة وابتلاهم الله بأن تأتيهم الحيتان يوم السبت دون غيره بكثرة فاحتالوا بأن نصبوا شباكهم يوم الجمعة فتأتي الحيتان السبت فتقع فيها ويأخذونها يوم الأحد فانقسم القوم لثلاث مجموعات مجموعة عصت أمر الله تصيد السمك بالحيل والخدع ومجموعة ثانية التزمت أمر الله تعالى ولم تعصه أبداً وكانت تحذر القوم من عقاب الله وغضبه وتنهاهم عما يفعلونه ومجموعة ثالثة تعارض المجموعة التي تنهى عن هذا الفعل ولما امتنع العصاة عن الاستماع لكلمات النصح أتى عقاب الله تعالى للعصاة ليلا ونجا من العذاب المجموعة التي أمرت بالمعروف وأما المجموعة الثالثة فلم يذكر ما حل بها وكان العقاب للعصاة أن مسخوا قردة ويروى أن المجموعة الناهية عن المنكر استغربوا عدم خروج العصاة كعادتهم فذهبوا إليهم فوجدوهم قد جعلوا قردة فعرف كل قرد منهم أهله ولم يعرف الناس أقرباءهم الذين جعلوا قردة وقالوا ألم نحذركم من غضب الله تعالى ومات العصاة الذين جعلوا قردة بعد ذلك بمدة Every Muslim in the world knows this story. Overcoming this kind of obstacle to build bridges between our religions and our societies is extremely difficult. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. No one is above the law and the judiciary. That is what Lebanon's Maronite patriarch, Bashra Boutros Al Rai, said. He's the top Christian cleric in Lebanon. He said it regarding the protests and violence in Beirut. He is speaking about the judiciary's probe into last year's horrific explosion at the Beirut port and the violent reaction it has caused. This violence may ignite more violence. 
sectarian violence between Shiites, Sunnis, and Christians, which has plagued Lebanon for decades and always lies just below the surface in Lebanon. Remember, the Lebanese suffered under a 15-year bloody civil war from 1975 to 1990. It appears that Hezbollah, the Shiite terror group sponsored by Iran, is fomenting against the investigation. We can only wonder at this point and speculate about why Hezbollah is so involved and cares so much about this investigation. In his sermon, the patriarch said, we must free the judiciary from political interference, sectarian and partisan political activism, and respect its independence according to the principle of separation of powers. Every Israeli prime minister is briefed on issues of safety questions concerning Israel and the Jews and all over the world and how it impacts on Israel. I was very happy to hear Prime Minister Bennett talk about internal challenges within Lebanon and in Iraq, and specifically about the grassroots opposition groups emerging in these countries. There has been violence and protests by Hezbollah on the streets of Beirut, opposing the judiciary's investigation of the horrific explosion in the port of Beirut. In response, popular voices are emerging, rejecting that violence and those protests. In essence, those voices are rejecting Hezbollah and Iran. During the recent elections in Iraq, Iranian-backed candidates did very poorly. Bennett said, wherever Iran interferes, there is violence, poverty, and instability. He continued, I hope the Lebanese and Iraqi people will succeed in breaking free from the stranglehold of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps and build a better future for themselves. I hope his hope comes true. When executing a search warrant, it's not uncommon for police to find the unexpected. In Brazil, police were searching the home of an accused serial child molester, and that's how they found a huge collection of authentic Nazi memorabilia. Uniforms, hats, helmets, all varieties of memorabilia. Included in the stash were also various daggers and nine guns. There was a rifle, a machine gun, and a large amount of ammunition. The collections was valued at $3.5 million. After World War II, Brazil was a safe haven for Nazis. Nazis could gather and sing songs and regale each other with the tales of their greatness and the greatness of the Nazi era and express their yearning for its return. The movie Boys from Brazil captures the essence of that period in history. It's estimated that over 9,000 Nazi officers found refuge in South America and that in Brazil, it was home to between three to 4,000 Nazi officers. Commemorating the Holocaust is a true challenge. There's no question about it. Amnon Weinstein found a moving and innovative way to do that. Weinstein, an Israeli, is one of the world's greatest violin restorers. He works on his, with his son. One of his greatest projects is collecting and restoring violins from the Holocaust. Weinstein calls the project Violins of Hope. The Jewish Federation of Roanoke, Virginia, held a concert featuring Weinstein's restored violins, playing music composed by composers who were murdered by Hitler during the Holocaust. The concert was called And Their Music Lived On. It was held in the Grandin Theater in Roanoke, Virginia, in a special show presented by the Roanoke Jewish Federation. In 2014, Germany invited Amnon Weinstein to bring his violins to Berlin to be played in the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Sweden has emerged as a hotbed of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. During an international forum combating anti-Semitism, held in a synagogue, the words, the Holocaust was a scam, were flashed onto the walls of the synagogue in Malmo, Sweden, the third largest city of Sweden. A light projector was used to project the slur and disrupt the event. It happened during the forum, which was taking place outside the synagogue at the time and intended for all the dignitaries to see. The same words were simultaneously projected onto the walls of other buildings, especially the municipal and court buildings in Malmo, Sweden. The police are investigating these disruptions and treating them as a hate crime. Security is one of the biggest issues that the Jewish communal leadership has to deal with every single day. They ask for and have received millions of federal dollars to help secure Jewish buildings and institutions. Now the quandary. 
with the increase of violence against Jews and Jewish institutions, leaders are questioning whether they should pull back on the visibly Jewish symbols of their building. They fear that Jew haters can easily locate and then deface and vandalize the institutions. They raise an important point, but the horse is already out of the corral. Very few Jewish buildings are unknown, especially the Jew haters. And a simple internet search can provide the address of almost any Jewish institution or building. They are listed in order to serve the good people they serve. Jewish institutions should not hide from those evil people who want to cause damage, perpetrate terror, and instill fear. They should bolster their security. Seriously, bolster their security. The IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the United Nations nuclear watchdog, announced that Iran has successfully enriched 120 kilo of uranium. 120 kilo is 265 pounds of uranium. That's an enormous amount of uranium. Iran countered the announcement explaining that according to their agreement, Iran was supposed to receive 20% enriched uranium, but that uranium was never delivered, so the Iranians made it themselves. Of course, the agreement also stipulates that Iran is not to enrich greater than 3.75%, but Iran, and for Iran, that's besides the point. They did it themselves. According to scientists who specialize in uranium, Iran is very close to the threshold for making a rudimentary nuclear bomb. A rudimentary nuclear bomb will require about 375 pounds, 175 kilo of enriched uranium. At 265, they're almost there. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. We spoke about Shemitah, the sabbatical year. The idea is actually modeled on creation. Six days of work, one day of rest. In other words, six years of working the land, one year of resting the land. At the end of the seven sabbatical years, which would be every 49th year, there's a Yovel. Yovel in Hebrew is the, uh, translated as jubilee in English. So Yovel is jubilee. On that year, all property goes back to its original owners and slaves are freed. Nowadays, the sabbatical year is obvious. We know when it falls out. But not so with the Yovel, with the Jubilee. We have lost track of when there should be a Jubilee. That's why we sound the shofar at the end of Yom Kippur prayers, because according to the Talmud, the Jubilee starts after Yom Kippur. And just in case it's this year, the shofar should have been sounded to announce it. One of the reasons we do not know the exact timing of the Yovel is described in the Talmud. It's part of a serious debate. The question is, is the Jubilee year the 50th year and then we begin counting seven again? Or is the 50th year the first year of the next seven? The issue is not resolved. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. <laughs> <laughs>